But on a first principle basis, if you don't have custodians, if you don't have intermediaries, then there is more money to keep for yourself or whoever you're transacting with, you refuse to pay. And if you look at the product market fit cryptos had so far, where is gas being spent on chain? Something like 80-90% is being spent on the Uniswap contracts. So the very clearest indication of product market fit for crypto today so far has been trading assets. Um, but crypto hasn't really found product market fit yet for daily payments. Which is kind of ironic since it was the riddle promise of Bitcoin 15 years ago to create peer-to-peer -to -peer digital cash. And so that's what we're doing at Zeal is to take the assets you have on chain and make them useful in the real world, being able to spend them in different places and connecting the, the off-chain world with on-chain world. So the on-chain wallet that's off the chain that you can use off the chain as well. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm joined by Hannes Gray, who is one of the builders of Zeal, um, yet another wallet. And we will go into kind of why Hannes and his team are building another wallet um, and what, what sets them apart from the existing um, myriad of wallets. Before um, we talk with Hannes, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis Chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus 1 not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus 1's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.1. Hi, Hannes. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Hi, Friedrich. Greetings from Brussels. <laughs> yeah, you're at ECC, aren't you? Mm, that's right. We're a couple of the builders here uh, experiencing ECC firsthand. Super nice, super nice. Hannes, you have a super fascinating background, and I think it kind of... Um, it's very emblematic of kind of like the changing landscape of builders in this space. Um, tell us about um, what you've done before, where you've been before, and kind of why why you embarked on a mission to kind of build Zeal. Um, prior adventures to Zeal was in, in retail or consumer experiences. A long time in Spotify and in Revolut. Uh, Revolut is probably one that's the most relevant for building a wallet, a Revolut being a, a mobile bank. Uh, in fact, most of us at Zeal uh, were a bunch of ex revolutors So we spent a lot of time there uh, reinventing the front end of banking, if you will, moving away from high street offices to to mobile interface. Uh, and now we're tackling a di different type of reinvention here at Zeal. Yeah, super nice. And you guys, you actually pivoted um, quite markedly with your project, right? Kind of like when you started, Zeal was doing um, something else, right? I, I'm not sure we call it pivot, but we have definitely gone from being broad to much more narrow in that, um, as you said, there are a lot of wallets out there in this space. And so we started building quite broadly, trying to appeal to a lot of different use cases. And we have built a lot of features that 
crosses the whole swath of things someone wants to do on chain from um, route optimized bridging to swapping to supporting every EVM under the sun. But what became more and more clear as we built more and more was that there was a, a gap specifically on uh, daily finance, the original promise of Bitcoin, if you will. Yeah, daily finance. That sounds good. If you think about kind of the landscape of wallets that are out there, how do you classify them in your head? So, so kind of when you say there's kind of like this gap for daily finance, what do the others cover? So I think if you're if you're a startup builder, you look for market opportunities and you see what problems people have. And if you look at the product market fit cryptos had so far, where is gas being spent on chain? Something like 80-90% is being spent on the Uniswap contracts. So the very clearest indication of private market fit for crypto today so far has been trading assets. And so if you're uh, building a wallet, you're like, okay, well, let's solve problems that are specifically on that use case, right? Let's make trading even better. And so we have a plethora of wallets that are really, really good at doing trading and moving tokens around. Um, but crypto hasn't really found product market fit yet for daily payments, which is kind of ironic since it was the original promise of Bitcoin 15 years ago to create peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. Yet 15 years later, it's still very hard to just send digital cash to someone, to their email or to their phone number. Even crypto veterans are not asking people for hex address to send over digital cash, right? And so the, the kind of counterintuitive opportunities to deliver on the original promise of Bitcoin uh, and make crypto useful in daily life for normal, boring, if you will, finance use cases and not just trading tokens. Don't get me wrong, trading tokens also has a role in the world, um, but there's so much more that people are doing out there with money than, than buying and selling tokens. So when you think about your user, who, who is that person? So the first customer segment, the first group of users we're targeting are indeed the people who are in crypto, but specifically the ones that want to put crypto to use. Um, and so people who want to use crypto for more than buying and selling tokens, like buying a beer, paying their rent, um, to use it in their day-to-day. And there are other people who are in crypto already and have assets there that they're not there. All for all the talk of, of increasing liquidity in the world by tokenizing assets, they're still compartmentalized in the crypto ecosystem, right? They're not made liquid in the real world. Um, but now we have various efforts that actually are making it possible to make them liquid in the real world, make them useful in the real world. And so that's what we're doing at Zeal is to take the assets you have on chain and make them useful in the real world, being able to spend them in different places and connecting the the off-chain world with on-chain world. So the on-chain wallet that's off the chain that you can use off the chain as well. So when I think about wallets, often the user experience is pretty terrible. So kind of kind of it starts with, these are your 24 words, <laughs> write them down, never lose them. Yeah, so basically, and, and then kind of you, you have to click on uh, you have to sign messages that you don't understand. You kind of, you don't know which sites you're connected to, which contracts you've given allowance to and so on. In order to kind of um, roll this out to, well, quite quite frankly, even for the people who are in this space now, now that would be nice, but to roll it out to even more people, those are things that kind of you absolutely have to fix, right? So how, how, how do you think about those problems? Yeah, I think we really are now at an inflection point where a lot of the fundamental technologies have been put in place over the last 10 years to solve those kind of technical problems, uh, I would call them. We have been revealing the piping of how the technology works to users because there hasn't been a way to do it in a smooth way. So examples you mentioned, we, we now have um, the, uh, the innovation of pi pass keys combined with biometrics that can take uh, seed phrases out of the, the picture, right? Seed phrases, the, the recurring... Um, pet issue for everyone in crypto, even the veterans, right? Where do you put your seed phrases? Um, now you can solve that with biometrics and passkeys and smart wallets or smart accounts, right? So there's a combination of these technologies that finally are reaching maturity, production readiness, if you will, that allows us to solve a problem like that. Scalability is another one. We have a lot of scalable, scalable, scalability solutions in play. And now we are getting to the point where we can almost consider transaction cost roundable to zero. But it takes time to get there, right? Traditional finance infrastructure has had a hundred plus years to iterate on the infrastructure and optimize it. And we only had a 10 and 15 years to do so in, uh, in crypto or DeFi. Let's maybe 
dig into this. So um, tell us about uh, the passkey innovation for for um, for keys. H how does that work? So for Zeal, um, we passkeys are passkey signatures cannot yet be validated um, on the base layer, right? So we have a smart contract uh, that validates passkeys on chain. So that means that when you create a, a smart wallet, a safe with Zeal, we do two things. We uh, create a passkey validator contract that's unique to each user, um, which then creates a safe, which is the signer, the first signer and the deployer of the safe. Um, that allows us to have consistent address space because we're always using this passkey validator contract to deploy safes on new chains. And then we add on a second locally stored private key to do ongoing transactions, which allows us to get the best of both worlds. So the efficiencies of, of signing with a, a locally stored private key, um, as well as the ability to uh, use the passkey for consistent address space, um, as well as a recovery model that uses a cloud solution like Google or, or Apple, depending on where you store your passkeys. So, so where, do you, where do you store the private key, the locally stored one? Yeah, so the, the second private key is stored locally uh, in the in the application. So I assume it doesn't leave the device? That's right. It's a locally okay. encrypted storage um, and it doesn't leave the device. In fact, we're, we're, we're also, um, we're basically not allowing people to export that private key at the moment because the private key is not meant to be exported. The private key, if you will, is a, the locally stored private key, if you will, is a, is a throwaway component of this model where the primary owner of the safes is the, the passkey validator contract. And so when you then recover to new device, a new locally stored private key is generated and then add into the safe for that device. Okay, t tell us a bit more about passkeys. So kind of like if, um, say, if I download Zeal as a mobile wallet and kind of I onboard with passkey, um, does this passkey port to other devices? So say I want to use it on my desktop? Yes, so as long as you have access to the same uh, cloud model, if you will, you can then recover it also in the desktop. So indeed, you can create it in your, you can create it in your phone and then recover it in the desktop or vice versa. Um, and there is not yet in production and interoperability between Apple and, uh, and other ecosystems. So that's something that is not just an issue for passkeys in crypto, but more broadly on how to create interoperability. But I would say here, the passkey as a movement in Web2 is something that's being adapted and adopted at, at scale, right? So it's something that is undergoing a lot of scrutiny uh, and security research because it's securing a lot of value, not yet in crypto, um, but in Web2. Um, and so it's always good, of course, as we know with in crypto to to work with the the larger trends um, that is getting the most scrutiny because um, that's where we can also build up security over time. Also, one of the reasons why we're using the safe smart contracts underlying for the smart wallet, they are the most battle tested at scale, securing the most value. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So coming back to the past keys, what's the underlying security model or the security assumptions kind of that kind of you, you say kind of like part of it is is synced via the cloud so whom do i have to trust in order to use a passkey so for the recovery model you do rely on the the cloud that you have your passkeys with um, to be available um, so that's for the recovery and for the ongoing transactions because the passkeys are validated uh, or the transactions are validated locally store private key you don't rely on that um, so in a worst case scenario if um if the cloud that you have your passkeys in would go down, let's say Google or Apple Cloud would go down, you still have the device that you have your local private key on. Um, so you can still make transactions and you could then um, replace that cloud and, and migrate over to somewhere else as a, as a backup solution. So, so what just is the, the, the recovery from the cloud. And then of course the local device, which depending on what kind of device, what kind of security the that has, right? If it's secured with usually biometrics, but could also be in some other kind of setup depending on the device. Okay, so kind of if if you were to kind of think in in an adversarial way, um, say the, for instance, Google or Apple are under an order to kind of rescind your passkey and not let you access it anymore. And for some reason, you kind of, you lost your phone with um, the local key on it. Is there anything you can do? If you lose both your phone and the cloud. Yeah. If you lose both your devices and the cloud, then there, there, there is difficult to do a, a recovery than this. But okay, if, you just, yeah. if you lose one of them, though, um, then 
then you can, still can have you access. Add right? More signers. So could I kind of say, okay, I want to add um, a hardware wallet, say an NFC hardware wallet that I kind of keep somewhere, you know, safe in a safe deposit box or so that I, I can use to kind of um, reset or add a new key. So this is the great thing about um, using existing smart contract infrastructure like Safe, right? That you have this ability to create a, a module, a security model. Um, our first version that's live in Pro today is a bit more opinionated, um, but we have the ability to add on indeed more signers. So you can indeed have your uh, your ledger, your Trezor, or whatever hard wallet you prefer. Um, but also more advanced security models outside of that. So you can move over to a, a two out of three model, for example, where you have a, a guardian that validates certain off-chain signals to do the second signature and allows a bit more flexibility. So, so there's a lot, because of the nature of a smart account, there's a lot more flexibility in creating strong security models uh, that are also easy to use because we really need both. It's, and this is kind of emblematic of, of a crypto that we can have build very strong security models, but they can also be very, very hard to use, right? Uh, or you can have very simple security models, but then and historically have not maybe been the most secure, right? And so finding the combination of both those worlds, we have both strong security and ease of use, is what is finally being enabled by a combination of smart accounts and some of these new technologies. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. So when you think about um, smart contract interactions, this is, um, I mean, you, you, you said that you're using SAFE as the underlying smart contract here. Um, so how, how do you handle smart contract interactions? Because some of them are... Um, very opinionated about the fact that you should use them with an EOA rather than smart account. Yes, yeah, so I mean one um, one challenge there in the broader DeFi space is the managing of signatures, right, and smart contract signatures. Um, but as we're seeing smart wallets become more and more adopted, this is something that we expect DApps, if they want to cater to the new audience coming in, they will also have to adopt standards to manage smart contract signatures. So yeah, there's there's definitely challenges in there. But if you look at the, the key dApps out there, they do handle new standards for that. Um, so uh, if you also think about a new wave of people coming in, they probably won't start with the most exotic of dApps, right? They will start with the, the dApps that do support smart wallet signatures. And also the smart wallet developers or builders like, like Zeal will obviously lead traffic to the, to the applications and experience that, that do support those signatures to not create broken user journeys, right? Um, so I think it's another one of those um, small bumps on the road in terms of figuring out the infrastructure that has to be in place for us to create great experiences for people. Speaking of great experiences, I think it's very notable that the Zeal app um, very is very mobile friendly slash caters ostensibly primarily to mobile users. What, how did you make that decision? So we built that Revolut, the mobile app first, and then a web app came second. Um, when we went into Zeal, we built a browser extension. So Zeal is right now available both as a browser extension, as an iOS app and an Android app. Um, and they look almost the same, to be honest, uh, because the browser extension format is actually not that different from that of an iOS or an Android app. Uh, so it's a it's a React React Native uh, application that looks pretty similar across the, the different platforms, uh, and we think that's a that's a, a format that people are, are quite acquainted to use, and also because it is the same on all three it means we can also have a very high rate of of progress and development where we basically launch the same feature across three platforms at one go. So if you look at the feature set of Zeal, it's very advanced in multiple areas. Uh, Zeal is the the only wallet that has uh, free instant bank transfers often on chain uh, integrated deep into the wallet um, or, or Gnosis pay cards, right? So you can see and manage your Gnosis pay card directly in there. Again, across three platforms in one go. Um, so embracing the mobile experiences and making that work across all three platforms uh, is, is a decision that allows us to both deliver something that is accustomed to users and allows us to move fast. Yeah, uh, talk about the IBAN and the Gnosis Pay card integrations. Yeah, um, so this is a, a key unlocker for us um, and for the industry more broadly, uh, being able to use your crypto, right? Um, one thing is being able to, uh, I don't like the word, but often on ramp, ramp implies that there's like a latitude or height differential, transfer is more even, if you will. Um, Bike Trust is the first teacher we launched that allows people to not think of their 
crypto assets as locked in a casino, but rather just another account, if you will, another another bank account, another wallet. There should be seamless and moving between them. Um, but still, it requires people to move money from the chain wallet to their bank account in order to spend them. Uh, but now that we have cards that allow you to spend, not just um, crypto that you sold into fiat, there are a lot of so-called crypto cards out there that aren't really crypto cards. They just allow you to very easily sell your crypto into a fiat balance and then spend that. What the Gnosis Pay card does and and with that zeal is to spend your actual on-chain assets, right? So um, within zeal on all three platforms, you can import either order a new Gnosis Pay card or import an existing one and see all the card activities, see your card details. You can freeze the card if God forbid you lose it, or you can also very easily add more uh, cash to the card by clicking a button doing a, a cost chain uh, top up swap. Um, so that's uh, that's one of the key building blocks to make this feel more like a, a self-custodial bank, if you will. It's not a bank, obviously, but make it feel as an experience um, as broadly useful and applicable as a new bank would. So I'm super happy about having now those kind of key building blocks for for the Zeal experience that makes uh, makes people be able to put their crypto to use. Yeah, super nice. And you initially said you're currently targeting mostly people who are already in the space. So when you look at your users, what makes them swap? Is it kind of is which what makes them swap to 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 Zeal? Because I mean, obviously, if you're a user, you already have a wallet. So what makes them swap to Zeal? Is it kind of like this? legacy integrations um, narrative that kind of you can use it as a bank account, you can top up to top up from your bank account um, fairly seamlessly that you can spend the cash. What's the main value proposition for people who switch? Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting to see. It's a, it's, a, it's a popular thing in crypto to complain about MetaMask, yet it's by far the largest wallet that the Hawaiian uses, right? And there's a reason for that is because it's been around for a long time people are, are, are used to trusting it, right? So it's not enough to just, just build a wallet that's 10x better in terms of feature set versus MetaMask, but it's also important to bring something completely new to the place. Uh, so if you put Zeal side by side with MetaMask, you now we have um, routing across different exchanges, ZRX, one inch, uh, doing route optimization across all the underlying markets. So you get the best rates. We have bridge optimization with sockets so you can get the best possible route to wherever you want to move your assets. Um, but but all these things are not enough, if you will. Um, and so what we're seeing now to be some of the most highly retentive use cases where people who, once they try it, they really, really stick around are indeed the ones that bridge between the real world finance and the, the on-chain finance. Um, so when we think about, I said that the target market, we think there's probably somewhere around half a million people who are crypto natives and want to use their crypto, on-chain crypto in real life today. It's, it's a rough guesstimate, maybe it's a million, you know. But the point is that's still a very small market. In the grand scheme of things, it's a tiny market, considering especially it's a global tiny market, right? So that can really just be the starting point, but it's also a good starting point in terms of finding people who have zeal, if you will, who have passion and who are, who are very interested in this. And so um, if we can deliver the things that they expect from a normal wallet even better, like a MetaMask, and then combine it with a very differentiated use case that they haven't been able to find anywhere else before, which is free bank transfers and car payments in one place. Um, then we think, and we see also for users who come in and try these features, that that is what makes them really excited, makes us stick around and continue to use Zeal. And if we take a step back then, okay, so why does that matter when we have you know the next billion people or whatever some might want to use for that? It's because it's the people who are in the space today that will onboard the people that come in tomorrow, whether they are sex converts or crypto curious or sex as a centralized exchange, by the way, uh, where, where are they coming in from, right? They will talk to you and to me and say, hey, um, what is this? What should I do? And so that's why it's important to to have the uh, the trust and the usage of the existing people in the space, right? Because they are the ones that then will tell the next person coming, yes, you know, you should try out, um, use this app here. And then they will say, oh, okay, but how to get my money in there? And instead of saying, here's a stack of five different solutions to get your money in there, they can say, well, you know, by far the easiest way is to create a wallet at the touch of a finger using Zeal, on ramp within a minute without any fees, and then you can use that DAP, you can buy the token, or even you know NFTs if it has a revival, right? 
whatever it is that you want the, the, or suggesting that your friend to do, they can do much easier there, right? So that's why in, in the grand scheme of things, while the total addressable market is much larger, the first market is people who are in crypto today. When you think about the total addressable market, right now we're talking about people who are in no way underbanked. So kind of like everyone who uses a zero wallet probably has three other bank accounts that have the functionality of a zero wallet minus the on-chain stuff um, at also zero cost to them. I mean, coming from Revolut, I mean, I, I would say probably at least in Europe, everyone under the age of 45 or so um, banks with a new bank, right? Kind of, so this is already what people kind of expect, like a seamless app um, that kind of allows you to spend and send. Um, how, how do you think about um, the segment of the world population that is underbanked or unbanked? So actually, we have a lot of use coming in from those markets. Um, we don't have bank transfers available yet in, um, you know, whether it's in Africa or, or, or Asia or Latin America. Um, but we see a lot of interest in there, not just Zeal, but also other wallets. Um, some of that uh, demand, if you will, is as simple as getting access to the dollar, uh, which in its digital form is, a, is in many places an easier form of dollar to access to escape the local fiat currency and get access to the dollar. And so uh, Zeal adding on more uh, territories with licensed use cases like bank transfers and cards uh, will also enable users, people, um, zealots, if you will, uh, to, to get access to, to the dollar and also other financial services on chain. Uh, the, the overarching, I guess the question we're poking at here is like, why, why a wallet um, versus uh, traditional financial services as well? In some places, they're hard to get access to the dollar, but in some places, they're actually, people do have financial services and they're quite optimized financial services. And I think the, the overarching why here is, if you just think about first principles, we've been optimizing the, the DeFi or OpenFi or crypto stack for 10-ish years. And so we haven't optimized it down to its most efficient form. We're getting there, right? We're, we're getting much closer to it. But on a first principle basis, if you don't have custodians, if you don't have intermediaries, then there is more money to keep for yourself or whoever you're transacting with if you refuse to pay. TradFi has had 100 plus years to optimize that stack. And that's why in some cases you still see the fee structure being more compressed, being more efficient in TradFi. But that's because we haven't had as much time. Now, I don't think we need 100 years to make it optimized in, in DeFi. We're already getting to there to now where we have several places where it, it can basically round off to zero. Um, but on a first principle basis, we will be able to deliver more value for people with, with DeFi and permission-free finance because there are fewer custodians intermediaries. Whether that's in, in Nigeria or Colombia or Sweden uh, or Indonesia. How do you think about gas fees in the long run? Because earlier you said kind of like in, there are already use cases where kind of you can run down to zero. Do you think this is something that apps will abstract away from the user or is this something that that's here to stay? The managing an infrastructure comes with cost, right? And so the question is just, um, well, first of how big is the, what's the magnitude of that cost and also who takes the cost? Uh, we're already seeing now a mixture of that. So if you look at 4337, we see, look at uh, gas abstraction and sponsorship, a large chunk, I think actually the majority of transactions in, are actually handled by, uh, by gas sponsorships. Um, and so you have, uh, whether it's a wallet specific use cases or dApps that have a business model elsewhere, subsidizing those transactions. But then there'll be transactions that are without any other uh, application connected to it, where a user might pay for that transaction, albeit at a, at a very extremely small cost that is basically round of, round, roundable to zero. So I, I don't think there's going to be one single dominant model on that. And that's also not what we're seeing today. We actually are seeing a, a diversity of that, uh, where where both users and application developers are paying for it. Again, the parallel here is to, to traditional finance, if you will, where um, a normal institution or bank has to think about, okay, um, what, where do we make money and where do we, what, what's the profit center, what's the cost center? Now, where do we give value back to users and where do we charge for users? And similar will happen, but in a more distributed and unbundled way in DeFi, where there are some places that money is made and there's some other places where, where things cost. And 
this whole stack will like dynamically relocate depending on the use case between users paying for some stuff themselves and for dApp developers or wallets, wallets or um, yeah, fun to get for look. Zeal is on several chains, and I think this this is probably this evaluation probably would vary a lot. Um, kind of looking at different chains, right? Kind of like say you want to abstract away gas on Ethereum, that's harder to do than say. Um, on on base or Gnosis chain, um, it's it be, just because you know the 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 margin is much uh, yeah. I mean, you, you kind of have to have a much better margin in order to be able to kind of abstract it away on those chains. Do do you see different models emerging that are kind of in keeping with the cost of transacting on different chains? Yeah, that's. I mean, that is what's happening, right? So. Um, the the fee structure is very different. Um, we'll we'll continue to see base layer optimizations that will drive dive down those costs, but we'll also continue, I think, to see more layers, um, maybe with slightly weaker security guarantees, but that allow other types of use cases where that is okay. And and how those costs are paid, that will also vary. Um, but we'll we'll need to get to a place where, and um, whether this is a layer two or an, a layer three, um, or whatever layer where we can basically get to smaller transactions where the, t- the cost of the transaction is, is basically roundable to zero. Um, we are in practice at that, including Moses Chain um, on, on several places today, a lot of time, right? Um, that it's basically can be considered as, as nil. Um, but there are also people still are willing to make transactions on Ethereum. Uh, ultimately, the user is the one that decides whether they are either willing to pay for this themselves or whether they are wanting to use the value and pay for the value of a, an application that is subsidizing it. But ultimately it's the user that decides on what they want to do, what they're willing to pay for either with attention or with money and through which path. And so I think what's very important for us is to build the things that people want, um, not just games, but also financial services that people want. Um, and then we'll experiment with those different models. Uh, whether it is a uh, transaction fee subsidized by a different part of an experience or whether it's the user themselves paying for, for transactions on, on, on a user experience. How do you handle interoperability? So say I have funds on one chain you support and I want to do something on another chain you also support. Um, will you expose that to me or will you kind of just handle it under the hood? Yeah, so first it is in networks. Seal is a, an EVM wallet. We support every EVM under the sun. Um, there are some networks that we have uh, stronger feature sets. So we have deep DeFi portfolio on 50 plus networks where you can see claimable rewards. You can see uh, your, your balances just as you load it up. You know? um, and then there's a smaller subset of 10 networks where we have safe support. So we support smart wallets uh, with a consistent address space. So one unlocker for the multi-chain experience of uh, all the smart wallets is to have a consistent address across all the networks. Um, but ideally, and I think this is what we're getting to, a user shouldn't have to think about multiple networks. And so what is the future of chain abstraction? There are multiple interesting attempts, I would say now at this, um, where um, different builders are indeed uh, creating harmonized balances, u- u- universal balances of assets across different chains, intent protocols where you say, I want to do this thing over here. Uh, and then you can, okay, pull assets from different networks uh, in an abstracted way. Um, I think this is part where we don't have the solution yet, the, the or we might have the solution, but it's not in prod, if you will, yet. Um, but it's something that a lot of builders are very actively thinking about. Um, long term, though, I don't know if we will live in a in a in a world where um, all the non, if you think about not the first million people, but the, the next hundred million people, if they actually will navigate across ten different chains, whether in a in an un- abstracted or unabstracted way, uh, I can very easily see that the future of connecting real-world finance with on-chain finance will be a bit more opinionated and that it will be certain use cases that are very closely connected to one specific chain. And when a user, a person wants to go deeper, they can then decide if they want to experience a bit more of the chains depending on how abstract it is. So as I say that more concretely and tangibly, right, what, what's happening tomorrow or today, um, it's that a user who comes in and says, I want to get an on-chain visa and start earning 10% of my deposits. They don't even need to know that that is happening in Osis chain, unless they click advanced details and dig into it, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not using a self-custodial wallet with on-chain assets fully at their own, in their own control, right? Um, and that's happening now. So 
chain abstraction is, I think, a mixture of both opinionated experiences where a user actually doesn't need to know it, and then a bit further time frame um, when users do want to go across multiple chains that they don't even have to know that they're going across multiple chains when they are with with uh, some of these abstraction uh, efforts. Yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, when you think about kind of like DeFi protocols and say staking applications and so on, and um, that people who um, use the want to use, is it something that you bring into the wallet or do you make people kind of go so kind of do you see the wallet kind of almost as a browser um in terms of kind of like accessing these different applications or do you just make people connect to it and then handle those totally differently so this is actually a super interesting question where um to what degree do you select and curate and king make if you will certain applications to what degree is it just an an open buffet an infinite buffet of, of different applications. Um, and in Revolut land, in traditional finance land, uh, you have monolithic companies that do a lot of the services in house. There are business partnerships, but a lot of it is like a monolithic structure and not that much flexibility in, in selecting various permission-free services. Whereas you have that flexibility in, in, in DeFi. At the same time, choice can be very overwhelming, right? So if a user comes in and says, I want to get the highest yield on my deposits. Um, then saying, okay, go and look at this catalog of a thousand different service providers. Um, that is not necessarily the best user experience, right? So striking the balance between how much is curated and how much is opinionated and how much um, is the user themselves exploring is a fine balance. And in Zeal today, we have a DAP browser, an explorer, if you will, where you can um, see uh, a catalog of all different categories of, of apps coming from from that radar is what we use that catalog and um, but also there are certain experiences that are more opinionated where um, there is is quick access to something um, so it, it's a fine balance um, and we we have an approach to that um, I don't think we have found the right uh, the perfect approach to it yet either because it's important at the end of the day to have user choice in this this is the promise of permission-free finance of, of open finance is for, for people to be able to make their own choices, decide what they want to do, um, but not completely without some, uh, some hand-holding and, and recommendation. So traditionally, this is kind of one of the areas where wallets try to monetize their product, right? Kind of like more or less kind of like selling preferential treatment within the dev browser in some way or kind of setting things as default and so on. How do you guys at Zia think about monetization? So today we, we have a number of different fund money flows, if you will, or asset flows inside the product. Um, none of them are charged with fees. So um, we do, we, we can swap inside Zeal, you can bridge inside Zeal, you can pay with cards, there's gas abstraction, you can pay for your gas and various tokens. There are all these different ways that, that assets are flowing through the product, which could theoretically have a fee attached to them. Um, first off, we need to build experiences that people love. Um, and really, the bigger picture here is not this first 500,000 customers. The bigger picture is the, the next 10, 100 million billion people. Um, and so the, the focus we do now, we think, should be on uh, if you have the, the capital to, to manage a service like this, in the short term at least, to, to focus on delivering user value, to maximize user value. Um, but if you look at business models and how these things can be monetized also in a per per permission-free environment where the user can decide, is to offer services that the user can decide and pay and opt into. But ultimately, the user is the one that decides. And in TradFi, the fees are sometimes hidden, all the regulations try to make them transparent, and they're kind of enforced. That There's no way for you to avoid the, let's say, the FX fee on, on a bank, right? It's there. You don't really have a choice. Um, in a, in a self-custodial permission-free wallet, uh, there'll be options for you as a user. And so you might be willing to pay for the convenience of using, uh, an integrated swap, which we don't charge for, but in the future, maybe that could be something to, to charge for, right? Um, but first off is to just, um, deliver the best possible user experience and you know, deliver something extremely sticky and retentive. Um, and then there are uh, lots of, of, of business models that can be built on top of something that facilitates or enables people to 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 manage their assets. Do, do you um, allow integrations with 
external financial tools. So for instance, can I kind of, uh, can I build a tax reporting software, portfolio tracker or something and kind of um, plug it into Zia? Since it's all, you know, on chain wallets and assets, um, the the switching costs or barriers are very low. You know, you have your you have your wallets and you can obviously load them up into whatever accounting software. Uh, Zeal as a piece of software um, doesn't today have those uh, external APIs, if you will, that you can connect. Um, but I think that's indeed, and now we're seeing some work um, with more modularity of, of smart accounts, uh, 75, 79 being announced and some of these efforts, right? Um, that are opening up the space, the design space for for more financial modules that are more closely connected to to the smart account. Um, so first off, we are very much focused on delivering the best possible user experience and use cases. Um, and as we see those getting more and more volume and traction, then we can also look at opening up certain services for an ecosystem of developers. But first, it really starts with the customer. Um, we think there will be, and there is happening more innovation in the space of modularity. So why not eventually have a, a card where you can you know, expose uh, a DAP image, uh, certain metadata that can very easily be surfaced to users who want to use a certain application. Um, so creating more more modular ways of integrating uh, DAPs into a, a, a user-facing experience. That doesn't require you to go off-site to a separate DAP page with its own with its own context, but rather having it in a much more integrated um, way. That's slightly opinionated, but still leaves a lot of uh, room for expression for individual developers. How do you think about privacy? Because kind of like when I think about adoption kind of for the for the next hundred million people or so, that seems to be the biggest block at this point. So people rightfully expect privacy from financial applications. So kind of, I mean, when we talked about earlier that basically Zeal Wallet can more or less do everything that kind of a neobank wallet can do. This is true, but at the at, at the cost it can uh, at the cost of exposing everything you do to uh, the wider public. And it's very easy to kind of um, tag wallets and kind of infer whose wallet is what. So kind of you can't you can't even say, well, does it say it's Friedrich's wallet? People will still know it's my wallet or people can find out it's my wallet. Um, how, how do you think about that? Two aspects of, of privacy are first, just in terms of our, our thinking on privacy and then more broadly how to make uh, finance is uh, private. Um, the Zeal, we we are very strictly a software developer, so we don't have any customer relationships. And what I mean by that is we 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 are we are not KYC customers. We don't have any. We don't actually even have the addresses of our customers. We don't store the wallet addresses of who's using Zeal. So if you ask me which wallet addresses are using Zeal today, I couldn't say that because we we don't store that. Um, and we don't want to store that. We are a piece of software. We're like a Louis Vuitton wallet, except uh, made out of leather. We're made out of bits and bytes. <laughs> so that's in terms of like the, the privacy. And, and when it comes to transactions, they are, um, they are before they go to the RPC uh, through, through Zeal, they're being relayed through our backend, which does not store any information about the user, right? So yeah, in one way, it's also almost kind of like a, an RPC VPN, if you will, or, um, or anonymizer. Um, of course, the RPC will see that transaction came from from the Zeal endpoint, from Zeal, uh, but not um, but not more than that. Um, so we take we take uh, privacy and, and user information very very seriously. Um, then the kind of bigger topic, which people coming into crypto might not realize, is indeed like on-chain privacy. So if I if I do a peer-to-peer -peer transfer to you, then that's on-chain. Everyone can see it. Um, same thing here. We're now I think getting to a point where there's a lot of infrastructure work and, and solutions that have been iterated and built on across the, the last couple of years. Um, you know, Tornado Cash um, had its complexities. I'm, I'm personally very curious to see how the next iteration of privacy pools, so building off the learnings from Tornado Cash and making it compliant with proof of inclusion and proof of exclusion in privacy pools. I think that's quite an interesting approach. Um, there are other builders as well that are doing here things here. Of course, the, the, the lead topic here is how can you create privacy while at the same time uh, reaching compliance for um, for making it actually useful and viable, right? And I think that's what's really interesting with the efforts of, of privacy pools. So um, when we bring on a lot more users that are not crypto natives, they will take privacy for, for granted. They will just assume that when you make transfers or payments to your card, that's anonymous. 
And so it's more like they will not, saying that they're private, those transactions will not be a value proposition for them. It's a hygiene thing. No one coming in from Web2 and you tell them, oh, by the way, no one will know that you're making payments. <laughs> That's like a, a hygiene thing. It's not really something that they will go like, oh, great. Like cool. this, this muesli is without uranium. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Um, and I, and I, I think you know, when I said in the beginning, like we're reaching an inflection point, this, this is, I think, so exactly what's happening in multiple areas. We're reaching a point where some of the hygiene plumbing, if you will, can now get on the surface and we don't have to explain to people. Same thing when someone comes in, we shouldn't have to tell them, oh, by the way, your transaction is not going to cost $10 and you're going to have to wait 50 minutes for the transaction to settle. That's not the expectation in Web2. And if you sell that, sell that to someone coming into Web3, it's not really a selling point. So um, a lot of the infrastructure solutions are like the table stakes that we finally sorted. So now we have like solid legs under the table and a, and a nice cloth. And now we need to cook a great meal on top of this table. Um, we have we have the building box in place. Now let's make a fantastic meal that tastes really, really good. And that that point, that inflection point is now. Now all those things are in place and we can start start making some sushi or whatever is your favorite. Cool. Yeah, let's talk about kind of the back end that kind of supports um the seal wallet. So kind of do you do you run your own nodes? Do you rely on third party providers? And how how do you make that decision? So we don't run our own nodes. We work with um a number of different um, node providers in the space. We have, uh, we have fallbacks, so we have, um, of course, everything goes, if you're, if you're working with a, a network that we have direct support of, it goes through through our backend and then to, to kind of this cascading waterfall of, of node providers. Um, so we work with, uh, with QuickNode, Alchemy, Impura, et cetera, the, the various node providers, depending on the network, because we support a very large range of networks. And so we have a, a mix of different node providers and also making sure that uh, we give really strong performance for um, for gas abstraction and account abstraction for on the on the transaction side. Uh, we currently work in by economy. Um, so uh, when you're when you're doing a bundle transaction, uh, that goes through through by economy. Okay, and how um, how do you store the local data? So say for instance, I give my wallet names or kind of I I uh, attach a node to a transaction or so. Where's that stored? So kind of if I if I do that on my phone and I, I log on to my computer to the same account with see it, I expect to also have that data available, right? So you don't. Um so from that point of view, there's no there's no concept of a, a Zeal account on our backend. I every installation that you make of Zeal on any device is a local installation that you set up. And so when you do go cross device, um you will then need to install that wallet, uh, whatever wallets you had on, on one device also or on another device. We have no concept of, of combination of wallets that we can like recover for you, which is a, a choice, right? It's uh, intentional because you decide yourself where you want to have which wallet and, and what you want to get associated between your wallets. But can you let me sync? So for instance, see, I, say I get a new phone, uh, can I kind of just somehow transfer the, that information? I mean, without kind of like passing it to you, just kind of passing it between my own devices. The smoothest transfer right now, and you can experience this if you just install Zeal, is um, the smart wallets. So you install that, you set it up with biometrics, you do the uh, set up cloud recovery with your, with your passkey solution, uh, and then delete the wallet. And then you can install it on another device and then do recovery. And you'll get that smart wallet recovered with, again, just a touch of a finger or face uh, on, on the next device. Um, but exporting your whole wallet setup and all, if you have multiple wallets added, um, we, we don't have any EC exporting like that. We definitely don't want to do it on, on our backend and store that state and you know have that be exportable. Um, but if that's something that users want, the, the zealots, if people want that, that's something that we could build, right? Um, the, the very short term, um, we... We think it's not going to be for users who are using Curve Daily Finance, probably won't have like 20 wallets in there. So we're recovering a new device will primarily, we think, would be um, uh, recovering your smart wallet and then adding on a couple of other wallets that you that you have stuff on. And so we haven't facilitated any export experience with that right now. But if people want that, then we're, we're listening extremely closely as we're a wallet that launched a month ago. Um, we are listening very closely to users to to hear what people want. And really doubling down on on, on their asks. So uh, now I know there's at least one user that want an easy export mode. Uh, so. I, I do, I do. So what, what's your? Um, I mean, kind of you you come from a very growth heavy background. So 
tell us about kind of your insights into growth and scaling on Web3. What what are what are the tactics that you will use for Zeal? Um, that's a very broad uh, subject area. It's very broad. Yeah, absolutely. Two thoughts. Well, as a as a new builder, product market fit is the, the number one thing to focus on, right? To make sure that you build something that people love. And so that's what we're obsessing about now is to listen to what people want and really doubling down on that and building more of what people are saying that they want and the, and eradicating any pain points that they may, might have. So things that they're that they're not liking. Um, and and I think in crypto tradition, last couple of years, you know, product market fit has often been obscured by tokens. Um, uh, distributing a token is not equivalent to product market fit, but that's quite often been the, the case of intermingling those two. Um, and the first thing is really to to make sure that people love what you're offering without any additional incentives. So that's first of, of what we're doing. Um, but then indeed, there are lots of incentives that floating around. And I think the, the crypto space is also the one that's been um, done a lot of actually innovative exper experiments as well with, with incentives in various shapes and forms because of the, the liquid nature of assets in our industry, right? Um, so I think there are some very interesting things to do uh, also in crypto using incentives, especially when we tap into uh, kind of these semi um, off-chain use cases that are, the uh, card is, is KYC, right? So over there you have some uh, civil protection. And so um, you can work with some of the mechanics that have been experimented with a lot in, in crypto uh, in a more even efficient way when you also add in, uh, add in some of the, the, the traditional finance use cases. But first off is just build something people love and listen very closely to what, what, what they don't love about what you're building. And so that's what we're obsessing about now. So when you think about um, five years into the future, so, so a very long time by kind of like crypto standards, um, where do you see Zeal at? So Zeal um, will be one of the drivers of making crypto useful. Um, and finally, did everything I said on the real promise of, of digital cash, making crypto useful in the daily life. Um, people will be able to uh, think of cash not just as this forgotten thing when the physical cash was eradicated, but have digital cash side by side with their centrally custodied assets. Um, we're not uh, by any means like decentralization maximalists that think that the whole world will become tokenized and decentralized. Um, yes, we do believe in that, that the, a lot of things will be tokenized and decentralized, but not everything. Um, we think five years out, these worlds will uh, go side by side and users will be able to choose um, what delivers the most value for them. And so, uh, if you will, it's kind of like open fire, the connection of traditional finance and decentralized finance in a, in a, in a more integrated world. Um, so five years out, I see people um, having some of their assets on a centralized custodian because they don't want to, 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 to have that, that responsibility or um, or take care of that. And some assets they will use in a more permission-free way. Um, and they will work with, they don't realize it's a protocol because they won't call it a protocol anymore, um, but they will work with a, a savings account or an earn account uh, always, right? Um, but it will be very natural. It will not be a, uh, oh yeah, I'm into crypto. It won't be that. It'll just be like, oh yeah, I, I'm using Zeal and I have some stuff on, in this wallet and some stuff in this other wallet. Oh, it's a bank account. Yeah, they're, you know, they're kind of side by side. One is self custody and the other one is centrally custody. Yeah, I mean, people also don't say I'm into internet backing, right? I mean, this this would be you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> people don't say, people don't say uh, yeah, I think Revolut has really good AWS solution. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's really good. If it, it uh, You can barely, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I, I totally hear you here. Um, so say people want, want to try out the, where do they go? Um, how do they inform your product roadmap by giving you feedback, and uh, how um, how do you generally interact with um, with um, the users? We zeal .app, Z E not zeal like the animal, but zeal as uh, as being passionate for a cause. And so Z E A L dot app, and that's our own page, or zealwallet dot com, or zealwallet on Twitter. Um, any of those uh, you can find zeal. Um, we we have our, most of our our zealot interaction are um, happening on Discord, on the discord.zealot.app, uh, also linked from any of the the, the prior platforms I mentioned, um, where we we do very regular um, uh, interviews, testing sessions, uh, often several times per day. Uh, we'd love to chat with you, um, with you or or anyone else who wants to try Zeal. Um, we often do like a half an hour chat where uh, you can try Zeal as it is if you haven't already, but also prototypes of things that are coming. 
Um, and so we, we try new prototypes every day. This is what we've been doing here at, at Bustles and ETC is to uh, show our prototype of new build uh, and have people click on it and see when they smile and when they cry. So far, no one crying, so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, and then just hit me up on a DM. I'm Gradient, G-R-A-A-D-I-E-N-T. Maybe it's going to be in the notes. Um, also very happy to do to do over DMs or, or video. Um, Telegram, Twitter, Discord, any of the above. Um, you're the boss. If you're the customer, you're, you're the boss. Uh, you decide. And so we'll listen to you wherever you want to talk to us. Perfect. Thank you, Hannes. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having us, uh, Frederick, and Deb Center. <laughs>